What's up, everybody? Welcome back to The Fear Alchemist. My name is Ben, your host. And I am stoked to introduce all of you, if you don't already know, to my friend Mike. He is a TV host. You guys also might know him from his YouTube channel, Fearless and Far. We are, I feel like we're brothers cut from the same cloth because we chase our fears and we follow what is most exciting to us because that's usually also what we're most afraid of. So Mike, my dude, thanks for being here. Awesome, Ben. And I think you and I both have the same actions when we see someone else so someone else with fear in their username. Like, <laughs> all right, let's let's check this guy out to see if he's actually like, you know, gets it. And uh, yeah, I, I think, I don't know who contacted who, but I think we both get it. Yeah, it's, that's exactly right. Like whenever I see someone, yeah, with fear, then I'm like, oh, what is it? And yeah, if they yeah, get yeah. it, has anyone, um, I would love for you just to give just like a brief intro of all the things that you've got going on because it is pretty cool. But And then to transition from there, I'm curious, has anyone ever said to you like, I imagine they have like, you're crazy or like, why are you chasing your fear? Like, are you just like a thrill seeker? I'm interested to hear what people have said about that. Too. Yeah. One funny thing is, so I'm here doing skydiving lessons and I've got a place near the airport. So if there's intermittent plane sounds outside my window, it's uh, <laughs> it's, it's from the airport. <laughs> um, yeah, no, great question. So first of all, I'm going to preface everything by saying that I originally had a fear of public speaking, a phobia of public speaking, and now I'm a professional TV host, YouTuber, and podcaster. So literally all I do is speak. And that's where this concept of fear and fearlessness came into my my online alias now, Fearless and Far. Because I realized that being fearless is not a state of enlightenment where you never feel fear. It's it's a relationship you have with fear and you don't let it push you around. It's It's an action in the face of fear. And so that's the idea of fearlessness. And I get all of the time people say, oh, you're a daredevil. Oh, you're, are you really fearless? All these, these types of things. Because I don't feel like people understand really what fear was or is or how much it impacts their life. And that's why I think for both of us, we got so fascinated with the idea because it is the silent puppeteer up top that controls your life in all sorts of sneaky little ways that most people don't actually realize until it hits them in the face or they're held back in life or they feel burnt out or there's a lot of different ways to do it. So yeah, um, but again, like I, I, I do, I've, I got lost in the Congo last year, had to trade a, a <laughs> crocodile for a bed with a pygmy tribe. I went to the depths of of Peru and uh, the Amazon to find shaman to do frog venom rituals. And it's, it's been, <laughs> <laughs> but the, I guess the idea is like I have a biology background. And one thing that I credit that to is a general understanding of how the world works. I love animals. I love nature. I love understanding the world. And with that in itself, gave me the confidence and competence to be able to be an explorer because knowledge is the antidote to fear. If you're afraid to swim in the ocean, I can probably guarantee you, you don't know how to swim, you know, or you don't really know much about the creatures that live there because the fears are, you know, the crack and great white sharks or, you know, getting swallowed by the deep blue sea. But if you can swim and you understand that there's no, there's very few creatures that really are out to get you, then you're, you, the fear goes away. And so with that knowledge of the world, I think it allows me to make calculated decisions. I'm not saying I don't take any risks, but all of my risks are very calculated. And what, when you look at my YouTube channel, you see some pretty crazy things. But what you don't see is how much time I put into understanding what risks could be there and mitigating them. Because I'd like to stay here for another 70 years, 60 <laughs> years if possible. Uh, that's that's kind of my goal. And also see a lot of the world uh, in the meantime. I love that, bro. And that was so perfectly said. And I definitely agree, right? Like it's it's just to echo what you said about the uh, the energy or the the mantra of fearlessness. Like you said, it's not the idea of like, no, I don't feel fear, right? It's no, it's your relationship with fear. And I love how you stated that. Mm -hmm. What has, so I definitely recommend people checking out your show on the Weather Channel and YouTube and your Instagram. And I love how you said people don't see what's going on behind the scenes, like, and how education um, can actually mitigate that risk, right? And bring enlightenment. And how you said fear is the silent puppeteer, bro. That's exactly what it is. And because mm -hmm. most people don't understand it, right? And that's why I get so excited to talk about it every single time. Because it is like a, I learn more about it every single day. So what has, 
man, there's so many things I want to ask you about, but like, let's start even just with the public speaking because so where were you? Like, how old were you when it was like, okay, like I'm terrified of this. And how did you get started just to like go? Because people see you now, right? Like on TV, traveling the world, doing scary stuff, like, like not just emotionally, like, I'm scared to put myself on social media and people's judgment. You're like, I'm literally putting myself in dangerous, physically harmful, potentially situations. So I'm just curious, like, where was that first itch with putting yourself out there and seeking and following what you're afraid of? For most of my adult life, I didn't, I guess I thought I was a little fierce snowflake in the sense that <laughs> I had I had these little fears inside of me and I didn't want anyone to know and I'm just, a, you know, something inside of me is wrong. And um, until I really thought about what, why I was scared of public speaking and um, and it made sense. And once you, if you do the work to look back and, okay, why do I feel this, this very strong, strange reaction to this very normal thing in real life? If you can trace back to the moment where you can say it all changed, often you're like, oh yeah, actually that kind of makes sense. You know, like no, anybody put in that situation would have some emotional damage that would, they could probably carry forward into an adult. So <clears throat> for me, I was in grade four and I'm Canadian. <laughs> from the east coast of Canada. And when I say east, I mean really east, like Atlantic Canada. So that's New Brunswick, which is right mm. above the, the state of Maine. Mm. And it's the only true bilingual province in a bilingual country because Canada mostly speaks English, except for Quebec, which is French. And then New Brunswick, my province, kind of gets wrapped around by the French province Quebec and then kind of butted up by Maine. And so we're officially bilingual. And in there, what's common for a lot of English families, like my family's English speaking, is to get put into French immersion in grade four, grade two, grade, it can be a lot of different places. But for me, it was grade four. So starting grade four, you do everything in French, even gym classes in French. Okay. So I'm starting my, my fourth year in school, all in French, barely can do English yet, but you know, all French. <laughs> there's, there's issues with that too. But anyway, so I, this story can take a lot of different directions, uh, depending on how, how gory you want to make it. <laughs> gory, and I say. Because, okay, so I, let's just say this. I have, I have three siblings. There's four people in my family. We all got hamsters. I woke up one morning. The hamsters had all killed each other. That's what happened. There's more gory detail there. But the hamsters, and I had never experienced death. I'm in grade four. The hamsters had some kind of fight. Don't know what happened. So I woke up, saw some blood and guts. Then went to school and pretty sure I was just distraught. Just pretty much staring, maybe just staring at my desk like this. Not knowing how to process this traumatic event as a grade four. That's like you're 10, maybe 10 year old. And I think the teacher saw this and she asked me what was wrong. And I say, Rien. like nothing, nothing's wrong. Don't know. And then she pulled me out into the hallway and she said, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, well, actually, there's this really crazy thing happened with the hamsters. And I started crying. I'm 10. I get back in the class. And I think what happened is she was, she realized that I wasn't upset when I left, but I came back in and I was really upset. And all the students were judging her a little bit because she had made me very upset outside and I didn't seem upset. Like I looked like I got in trouble for no reason, basically, right? And then she had this the fun idea to change my life forever by saying, <laughs> can you explain to the class why you're upset? And so I go to the front of the class and, uh, and uh, in English, I start to say, last night? And she goes, en français. En français. And so she's trying to get me to explain my the hamster massacre of the previous night <laughs> in French. I know how to say like, where is the post office? And can I go to the bathroom? I don't know how to <laughs> explain bloody hamster murder. So that was my introduction to public speaking, trying to explain the slaughter of my pet hamster in front of a class <laughs> in a language I barely spoke. And so that that was the first time I'd been in front of a group before, man. I had never spoken. I don't remember even feeling fear before that, really. Mm. But I remember in that moment, it was not a fun time. And at, at 10, you're a little budding ball of clay and those dents and scratches just get hard baked in as you grow up. And so I took that forward forever. And I, again, thought I, I was trying to hide this thing where I was always scared in front of a group. Yeah, very poorly, by the way. I remember doing speeches in uh, in university. I think the first years where I was holding a piece of paper 
and it, my hands were shaking mm. so bad I couldn't read the paper on on the in my hands. Um, and then I ended up balling up the paper, and I had rehearsed it a thousand times before because I was always so nervous that I could. I realized in that moment I could actually do it by memory and not mm -hmm. have to have this this telltale sign of of my nerves as the paper. But it was it was a battle, man, um, for a long time. But the the most important thing it was me realizing like, okay, like this feeling that I have when I'm speaking publicly, anybody who had to deal with that in grade four would probably feel the same way. It's nothing, nothing's broken about me. Like these are things that make sense. And then from there, you can find a place of healing and not a place of, of like regret or self-loathing about how you are built a certain way, you know? Dude, I love that. And I like how you've even turned it to some humor, right? Because <laughs> The, the hamster massacre or whatever, but it's like, um, and like, so how old were you when, cause you said something about in like universe, like in university, you were doing the speech, like what were you doing beside before you just went off on advent, like turned explorer? Right. Because it wasn't one day I wasn't just like, oh, right. Screw this. I'm going to be not, you know, not feel fear anymore. It's not mm -hmm. how it works. Right. So. Uh, how it worked for me. I remember that specific moment being pivotal where it's like my first or second year university um, doing biology and just not being able to function in front of a group of, of that setting and realizing that I can't, I can't live this way. Um, but I didn't know how to change it. And I don't know whether it was the gifts of the universe or maybe some subconscious desire to, to deep down make different decisions. But uh, I was a sword fencer uh, for 10 years before that. Mm. Semi like quite competitive across USA and Canada. Um, but I was always interested in break dancing. So there was a break dance club in the university. And fencing was okay, but I was kind of getting a bit disenchanted with it. And I decided to start break dancing classes, not knowing that that was probably the perfect thing I could do to start start myself down the path of dealing with my fear of being in front of a group. Because you, you they teach they teach you a few things. Number one, that it's not really called breakdancing. It's called b-boying or b-girling. Mm -hmm. uh, but in this sport, they also teach you that if you make a mistake, if you, if you don't acknowledge it, people generally don't realize you made a mistake. So if you're, you're doing like a little flippy flip, you fall and you crack your elbow and you jump back up and you're like, huh, you cross your arms, b-boy stance. People are like, oh shit, he meant to do that. Oh my God. And they clap. But if you fall and you bump your elbow and you go, oh, Oh, and you grab it and you slink away, people realize you made a mistake. That is literally how public presentations work. It's how a lot of things work in life. If you act like you meant to do it, people generally think you meant to do it. On top of that, if you act like you're enjoying yourself, even if you're not, people will generally enjoy watching you. And that applies to anything in front of a group. It could be DJing a set. You know, we all love a DJ who's like pumping his fist in the back, right? And the one who has his head down and shoulders up, shrugged away, isn't as much fun. A dancer as well, or any kind of musician, it, it, when they're presenting or dancing or expressing themselves, if they smile, then you have a good time watching. Going to a wedding is a good example. You see people on the dance floor, they don't have good dance moves, but they're having a good time and you watch them have a good time and you have a good time. And that's another lesson that, that, that came up quite powerfully as well, is that if you just act confident or act like you're having fun, even if your heart's racing and your palms are sweating, people will feel the same way. Uh, on top of that, it was a great activity to be in front of a group and improvise because there was no notes per se. It was just move your body to the music and you didn't have to speak. So I could get used to being in front of a group with fake confidence and <laughs> would not have to speak and then still be able to get more comfortable there. So that's how it started. And I attribute b-boying as a big gift in my life to to be able to originally get over that that fear of being in front of a group. And then from there, um, dance itself became quite an instrument in my travels. So I, I found out through solo traveling specifically, because I was scared to do that as well, that there's a lot of lessons to be, to be uh, learned there as well. Because you, you'd learn to become independent. You get thrown at a jump on a bus, you take the wrong one, you end up at 3 a.m. at some Japanese bus station where there's no one there and you got to fix your problems. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. between uh, b-boying and travel, those are the two things that were able to open me up. That's dope, dude. So when did you decide to travel by yourself? Because I know from what I understand, that was also quite terrifying. 
I was finishing up my degree and I had a trifecta of bad things happen. I had a death in the family. It was my grandfather. Mm. I had a, a bad breakup with a girl, very bad breakup, and also a car crash all in a month. And I had a friend of mine who also was going through similar things. And we were thinking, we just have to figure out a way to get away from it all. And there was a poster on the wall that said, hey, do you want to travel to the other side of the world and be a research <laughs> assistant? And me and my friend were like, yeah, we want to go to the other side of the world because this side kind of sucks right now. And we fundraised and fundraised. And uh, eventually the day came to pay the deposit. It was several thousand dollars to lock in our spot to go to Sulawesi, Indonesia, an island off of Sulawesi, which is the middle of nowhere. And I went to go pay. I paid the deposit. My friend said he'd meet me in the bar after. I go to the bar. He's an hour late. I get a text saying, sorry, bro, I couldn't get the money together. Mm. Not going to be there. And I remember, again, being very scared, saying, thinking I am now going to the other side of the world to a place where I don't speak the language, don't eat the food, don't know anything but by myself. And I'm, yeah, I don't know what's going to happen. And I boarded that plane and waved goodbye to my family, which I thought would be like maybe the last time I see them. And then went over there and had the best time of my life for three months. And I again, another data point where the thing that I was most afraid of was the thing I just didn't know very much about and turned out to be mm. incredible in my life. And my entire life is travel now, bro. Like, it's, it's all I do. And I almost didn't take that trip, right? If my friend would have bailed out before I paid, I probably wouldn't have paid. And then I don't know what I'd be doing now, uh, but it'd be something very different. You'd be fencing. I'd be a professional <laughs> fencer. <laughs> I, awesome. I, I, li I like fencing, but uh, breakdancing got more girls than fencing. Yeah, uh, that's for sure. <laughs> well, dude, it's why I love hearing all of this is because what you said about data points and right, like all these different things that you're experiencing, you're like you're collecting this experience and this evidence to literally give you the courage. And it's cool. I mean, I just resonate with this so much is like the universe usually... I mean, I know it does. It just depends whether we recognize it or not, right? Because you could have still backed out, like even though you paid, right? You could have backed out. You could have backed out of um, breakdancing, right? You could have backed out like all these different things that you have done. Um, you could have backed out like... Because things are always trying to like propel us, right? There's always something that's happening that that will take something away, right? Mm -hmm. Like the girlfriend, the car crash, the death, like that stuff is usually like the catalyst to propel you forward. But a lot of the time, it's people tend to not follow that momentum, that inertia, right? That's like pushing you to adventure and to really your purpose, your destiny, whatever you want to call it. What do you think that was just like innately in you? Like even though you're terrified, it's like, okay, I guess I'm just going to go. Maybe. Uh, I think one of the tragic things about our species is that we have to get kicked in the nuts before we do anything. <laughs> we don't just watch a motivational video on YouTube and go change our life. We have to hit, hit rock bottom uh, or very close to it. And I think that people who have this innate need to change everything when they hit the bottom, those are the ones who become the most successful. Uh, because uh, maybe you start to see it more opportunistically in the sense that, okay, no, this can't all be ha happening just to make me suffer. There has to be an opportunity to grow here. I think if I have a skill or a talent, let's say, that I was mm -hmm. born with, maybe it was something like that, that it when, when stuff gets really shitty, that I can say, okay, well, let's find a way to make this work for us, right? Because there's nothing else we can do. I think with that, I don't know where that came from. Maybe it was my upbringing. Uh, I don't know exactly, but I've always, when time get, times get tough, I always default to, okay, shit, but what can we do from here? Um, I think that's it. Yeah, dude. And when did you finally, like consciously, because all of these things are kind of like subconsciously guiding you into like who you are and what you're doing now. When did you consciously start choosing to do the things that you're afraid of? It was after that trip <clears throat> that where I was so terrified to travel by myself and then went there and it was a place. So Sulawesi is a, a, quite a big island in the middle of Indonesia. 
And off of Sulu- Sulawesi, there's an island called Bhutan. And after, uh, not the Bhutan, different Bhutan. And then off that, there's an island called, the island chain called the Wakatobi Islands. And off of the second one, there's an island called Hoga. So we are a speck of dust in the middle of the ocean at this point. And there, there was no running water. <clears throat> there were no mirrors. And we were there for three months. There was this makeshift uh, research base set up there by, I think, the university, a university in London or something, where research assistants, which what I was, could come and help actual marine biologists with their work. But I, up until that point, man, I thought I knew how the world worked. I guess you go <laughs> to work, you go to go to school, you get a job, you get a house, you get put on a tie, maybe work at a bank, work for the government. That's what you do. Um, and you have to do these things. I never really felt like I fit in personally. I had a hard time feeling like I fit in. Um, but that's the only thing I thought I had to, I could do. But when I got there, again, not having a mirror, not having running water, and there was probably 10 or 15 of us from around the world as assistants, not just me, people I didn't know, but uh, from like the UK, from Australia, everywhere. And you saw really interesting things happen. <clears throat> Because you show up, you got your nice new Columbia North Face gear or whatever for the jungle, the beach, and then you got your your hair gel and your nails painted and all this stuff. And then after two weeks of no mirrors, no running water, you're covered in mosquito bites, your hair is all messed up from the salt water, there's cuts and scrapes from the limestone, and you, the outer shell is so beautifully removed from all of us mm-hmm. that it's the people who had done the most work inside were the most beautiful, not the people who had done the most work on the outside. And I remember seeing that very distinctly because there was this cute girl that I saw on the first day there. And I'm like, oh, I wonder if I can like, because we were here for so long, maybe we can talk. And then after a couple of weeks, she wasn't so pretty anymore. Um, and there was nothing really inside that was pretty at all, honestly. She had put so much time on the exterior and not, nothing on the interior. And some of the more shy people were like incredible. They knew a bunch of jokes. They could play guitar. They, you know, mm. all this interesting stuff. And that shifted how I saw the world because I was like we all were, putting way too much importance on, on how we look on the outside. Because you have to look good most of the time. But in a situation like that, you get to see who people really are without the, the mask, right? Without the plastic coating them. And that was a powerful change in my life, knowing that if I don't fit in where I'm from, there's other places where I can fit much better. And I guess I compare it a little bit to like a lens where you're born with a lens of the world. And for some people, the lens is blurry. You can't quite see your place. It's, it just doesn't seem right. And as a traveler, you have to smash that lens. That's what traveling is. And you pick up little shards from different places. Maybe it's uh, the views of death from Mexico and how it's more of a celebration. Maybe it's how, okay, so suits and ties aren't the most important thing in the world. Maybe it's you know, developing, you know, knowing how to tell a story or you know, knowing how to dance. There's all these bits and pieces that you can recraft your lens with, reforge it. And then from there, you can clearly see your place in the world. But for anybody who's stuck in their hometown and they don't see like they, they don't feel like they found their place, Man, you got to leave. You got to you got to find the fragments and and forge it. And no one there is generally going to recommend you to do that because they're all there, right? The people who are going to say, "Hey, travel the world and collect pieces for your lens," they're already out there. They're not hanging out, you know, at the at the Irish pub or at the bar. You know, they're they're out there doing exactly that. And so you have to leave to find the people who are going to influence you to go further. So um, for me, I. I would say I was pushed by life for most of the things um, I'm now known for, which is again traveling and public speaking. Life gave me a big shove in a direction, and I had I did have a ch- chance, or I could have chosen to walk the other direction and come back in a place of fear. But for whatever reason, when I got shoved, I said, "Shit, well, I'm here. Let's see what. Let's explore the rabbit hole." You know, dude, that's that's so powerful. And one thing you said really stuck out to me like you felt like you didn't fit in and most people who are listening to this I imagine feel the same way how did you feel like do you remember how you felt Mm -hmm. like specifically like what made you actually feel that I just didn't I didn't I didn't and I don't know if I couldn't didn't or wouldn't understand (laughs) (laughs) understand how the world worked I just at that point like I was just out of high school. So you still have that high school mentality. There was still like the cool kids and the not cool kids. And then 
all these things that people thought were cool that I just thought were stupid. And, but I, I had this weird tug of war where, no, I, I want to be, I want to be in the, 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 the cool kids, but I don't understand what they're doing and they don't, they don't accept me. So F them, you know, it was this yeah. like love hate where it's like, I don't want to be part of your group anyway, kind of attitude, which is kind of toxic, right? Like I, you want to be confident with yourself. Uh, but I, I, that whole system of, that you get, like system of society, of the hierarchy of high school, and also is a bit prevalent in university, but not as much. That seems to form who, how you understand the world. I just couldn't fit in that system. I don't know what it was. I know I, I wanted to. If, I mean, if someone said, hey, we're going to make you the most popular kid in school, I probably would have been very happy with that. But there was <laughs> not a reality where that was going to happen. You know what I mean? And so I think like most most kids at that age, you want to be popular, but you hate the popular kids because it's kind of like you just don't, you don't have it, right? How could you not generally want to be loved and respected by everybody? That's kind of a very natural human desire. And for many of us, if we don't have that, we just choose to resent it and, you know, throw a middle finger up and say, I, I hate those guys anyway, you know? Yeah. So um, for for me, I was just never, I guess that's probably where it started. And that continued into the... Um, continued into university. But actually one thing that's, that, that maybe that it all started with is because I'm from the, the forests of Canada, I loved animals. I loved especially the creepy crawly animals. So snakes, salamanders, frogs, spiders. I loved all of these animals in particular. And I think, I think it all stemmed from my parents. Uh, I think my father, since the ocean there is, is very bio not well bio intense maybe is the right word but the bay of funday has the highest tides in the world that's the mm -hmm. little bay between maine and canada and it's like 45 vertical feet of water twice a day so it's an it's a giant that's crazy. lung it's it is crazy it, it it's, a, it's a lung that pumps in fresh water from the from the bottom of the ocean full of nutrients so it's full of whales and interesting creatures so tide pooling is really really fun there there's all kinds of stuff and there's giant tides and in there there's getting, crabs and lobsters and i remember as a kid my my father would show me these creatures that could be creepy or you know crawly and be like hey look look how cool this this thing is and then i would look everywhere for them i would flip over rocks in the mm -hmm. woods I, I, always on the search for oh my god there's a treasure in all these these places people are afraid to look and then i, I was also taught that these things weren't dangerous so you see a, a crab with its pincers or you see a spider or a snake and where I'm from, these things are not dangerous. They're just very cool creatures doing their thing. They eat this, they reproduce this way. And I became fascinated with the idea that people were afraid of these things, but they weren't dangerous. Like, why are we afraid of things that aren't dangerous? And so I would collect them. I would show my friends. I chased my sister with so many spiders and frogs that now she loved them and did a PhD in biology as well. <laughs> uh, and I think that's where it all started, where this, this understanding that the world doesn't understand what the world is, that people think all these crazy things, but it's not based on logic. It's based on fear. It's based on misinformation. And that quest, I believe, started with snakes and spiders in the woods of Canada. And now it's more countries and festivals and cultures where I'll go to a place where everyone says it's dangerous. But again, I've done the research. I've looked it up. I have a contact. And we show the beauty of a place that very few people choose to go to because they have all these preconceived notions or this misinformation, disinformation about these places. And so as a kid, I lifted up rocks trying to show people how interesting the things they, they are scared of are. And now I do that with countries and activities and cultures. Damn, kind of dude. Have you made that connection before? Not as consistently as I did right now. So, yeah. Yeah, dude, that was really cool <laughs> to like hear, hear you describe that. Because mm -hmm. obviously, like what you just ended it with, how that curiosity began of like, these things are actually safe and what you said of like looking under rocks and I was like oh he's literally doing that in real life and then yeah. you, then you ended that perfectly right of yeah that's exactly what you're doing and how you yeah. said like the treasures I love that because one of my favorite quotes is the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek yeah Joseph Campbell mm -hmm. yeah and so that's exactly what it is right is um well, you might be afraid to look under that rock or to go into the cave or go into the country or to leave home or to leave the job or to say yes to your dreams, whatever the thing is. But like, that is 
the treasure, right? Like yeah. looking under that rock is your freedom. It is your fulfillment. It is the most expansive part of life is in that cave and under that rock. Um, and it sounds like you've gotten like a ton of evidence, right? To support that from an early age of to be curious and like follow that hunch of excitement slash um, fear or terror. What was, I'm curious, have you, I'm s- s- curious if you're similar to me at all, where it's like, have you used this aspect of you as like a mask? And I'm, why I say that is because for me, I thought because I chased my fear, I wasn't afraid. But really what I was doing is using my fear as a way to not feel afraid. Meaning, and I don't think it's wrong, right? Is like, just like you, I was instead of like, okay, something wrong or bad is happening. Well, what can I do? Well, like, let's make the best of it instead of just sitting and suffering. But at the same time, I've learned that it's like, oh, I'm actually, I was afraid of being afraid. And so this was my trauma response or my coping mechanism. Very helpful and very productive to do so. But I've discovered more through emotional things later, like through relationships, um, like starting a family, like certain things where it's not just like a physical danger, you know, potential danger. I'm curious, have you discovered where it's like you lean on that and it's like maybe you're not as vulnerable as you could have been? I'm curious your thoughts and feelings on that. By talking about fear, that you are using it as a crutch to not deal with the fear? Yes. I haven't really thought about that, honestly. I I guess my, my thoughts on that would be that if I'm speaking about fear, I feel like it's giving me less, it's, it has less power with me. But at least in my life, I felt like it was the thing sneaking in the background, the monster under the bed that I just chose not to look. And so from now, I speak about fear very differently where I, I know it's a player in, I think the, I think the difference was is that, is that I thought it was a player in my game. And the second I realized, no, it's our game. It's not just me with this fear. We all have fear. And sometimes the people who seem like they have none have the most. And I think that's how I got to a place of empowerment with the feeling is that, again, this idea of a fear snowflake where I'm just a special little thing that has this, these feelings inside. No, man, we all, we all have this, this force inside of us that can destroy us or can point us the way. And with that, it's been interesting to be able to see because I've, I've thought about it so much and I've dealt with a lot of my own. Um, I, I feel like I can kind of see when I, see people getting limited with decisions. And that has been very empowering too. Mostly because it helps me reinforce the idea that when I do feel fear, because I still do all of the time, that it's such a human experience that no matter who you are, you feel the fear, that it's it's ingrained inside of our bodies, that back in the days of hunter-gatherers, if you didn't feel feel fear, you died, right? Um, so feeling fear, the ones who felt fear and ran away often were the ones who survived. And so we we have, like fear is so human, but we reject it so often. And I think it's a relationship with the feeling that we all get caught up on. Um, but for me, it was the most empowering thing was realizing that we all, we all feel it, you know? Boom, I love that. And it's, um, I like how you said, because this is what I have found out, you know, through years of, podcasting and interviewing, having conversations behind the scenes and now coaching successful people. And I found out like my expectation that I was going to find someone who didn't feel fear, but it was the opposite. Just like what you said of like, sometimes the people who seem like they don't have any actually have the most. Mm -hmm, For sure. One of the most powerful things, this is probably on the top three or four things that changed my life in the face of fear. It it was this moment too, where as I was starting to understand more about this feeling that I had felt, I was watching this interview with a guy named Jeb Corliss, who is a quite accomplished uh, squirrel suit skydiver, flying suit. And it was this woman, he had just done some feat of incredible talent of flying through something or around something. And this 
naive reporter comes up and she goes, oh, wow, Jeff, this is so amazing. You just don't feel fear, do you? And he snapped a little bit and he said, what, like, I feel fear. I feel vivid fear. What are you talking about that I don't feel fear? I feel fear more vividly than most people. Mm-hmm. I just choose to do it anyway. Like there's, there's no not feeling fear. Of course I was afraid. Like this is, a, what's, what's with this question? <laughs> I'm paraphrasing. I, it's been like so many years since, since I listened to it. Um, but the idea was like, that's what are you talking about? I don't feel fear. Of course I feel fear. I just choose to do it anyway. And then that was like a gong in my head. It's like, wait, you can, you can do that? That's something you can do? I thought you just turned tail and ran, right? That's the natural response. But the, the, the idea seems so crazy and foreign of just feeling fear and doing it anyway wasn't a concept I was even aware of. And that was a really interesting turning point. Because then whenever I had felt fear past that, I realized, okay, there is a choice to make. The, the road is now forked, Mike. One version <laughs> of you decides to put on your little adventure hat, get your walking stick and brave the trail. The other one turns around and runs the other direction. But in every moment of fear, there's always a fork in the road. And you, I, I like to think that you've, you, it's a fractal of the universe. There's a version of you that goes and does the thing and a version that turns around and the universe forks right there. And you get to choose which universe, which version of you you want to be. And that's very empowering and terrifying. <laughs> but when you, when you live that way, you realize that there is no choices because you, ha- you obviously you are going to take the right way to go. You're not going to go to like loser, loser Mike universe. You're going to take the one that you know is the best choice. And when you remove yourself from that, then the path becomes clear and that there's really no choice anymore. So when someone says, hey, do you want to, you know, do this presentation next week? Or, hey, you should really apply for a promotion or you just you're like, oh, so many times in my life, Ben, I've been like, oh, shit, I have to do that thing. <laughs> I have to do that thing that that's in my head, you know, skydiving lessons or public speaking tour or whatever. It comes up and there's an opportunity and I go, I'm not even really excited. I'm excited, but I'm, it's just the the realization that the only path forward is through that thing that you're scared of. And it's just like this feeling of, God, all right, shit, (sighs) let's do it. You know, I did. I very know very well, (laughs) (laughs) excuse me, know that feeling. And I appreciate you being so open and honest about fear in general. What is something, like whether it's right now or any time in your life, what would peop- what would surprise people of you feeling fear? Like whether it's something physical, like you going to the Congo, the alligators, whatever, or something, you know, um, maybe what people don't see you for. Like what would people be surprised of the fear that you feel? Yeah, well, I still get scared public speaking. I still, it still happens, right? Again, I, I, I'm on my third, um, well, just about to start the third season of my TV show, hopefully, and also have the YouTube page. Uh, all I do is speak. But when it comes to public speaking, man, I still feel the fear. And I have so much experience with that, right? I've done so much of it. And I've, a lot of it's, I mean, if it wasn't well done, I wouldn't be here, right? So, even with all of those data points in my head, all the previous experience, all the successes, some failures too, but again, despite the failures continued forward, I still feel that original primary school fear of what happened when I was in grade four. Mm-hmm. And I used to hate that. Like, why won't this go away? It won't. I don't think it'll ever go away. I think it'll always be there. You know, holding my hand, asking for love and forgiveness or asking for permission or whatever it is uh, my entire life. And that's why we say it, it's a relationship with fear, right? Because I don't think those original fears go away. So maybe you have a traumatic swimming accident. Probably every single time you're going to feel a little bump in your heart. Maybe. I don't know. That's just my experience. My relationship hasn't, again, the fearlessness is not that I don't feel it. I still feel fear often. With the, the travel and adventures, I don't really feel too much. I do a lot of research. There's been a couple of scary moments, like getting chased by the military police and getting shot at in Turkey. Uh, that was a different kind of fear. But generally, I, I still I still deal with the same childhood bullshit we all do. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, um, <laughs> dude, I just appreciate you sharing that. So. 
to slightly, um, I mean, not switch gears because we're talking about fear, but I want to read part of the post that um, it was you were reflecting on ayahuasca. And so I just want to read part of what you journaled. And then I just am curious just to talk about that a little bit. Um, Because this is just really good. So I want people to hear this. All of my fears are a plastic wrapper on my life. You wanted true fear. You didn't know, you poor thing. There is primal fear, creationary fear, one that spawned in the pond scum with you. It is violent, erratic, vivid, and originates from part of you so deep you didn't know it existed from the creation of man. All of your silly human fears are nothing. Fear of what other people think, fear of not being enough. These are laughable, dismissible. They are nothing. You create these out of nothing. Let them go. How much would life change if you acted in the face of each one? So that's pretty powerful, dude. Uh, was that what ayahuasca was telling you? Like, did you see and hear that? Hmm. It's interesting to hear it read to me because that just happened two two weeks ago, maybe three. And I wrote I wrote that the day after, and still kind of on the come down from that experience. And I had done ayahuasca twice before, once in Peru, which was quite an intense experience where I had a couple shots and saw all sorts of swirling patterns. And I guess if you haven't done it before with a lot of these psychedelics, you kind of feel like you're Neo in the matrix where you start to see the, the code. It feels like the code behind the, all of the outsides. But instead of code, it's patterns, fractals, geometry, colors, things like that. And that's where the overwhelming sense of togetherness and oneness is, as you see everything painted with the same patterns, this coding, let's call it. <laughs> and that was cool. And I, I felt like really interesting experiences, feeling awe um, and joy in, in levels that I hadn't experienced before. Like, when do we feel awe? We say, awesome, bro. But when do you really <laughs> feel awe? Like true awe, right? Uh, the second experience was in the depths of the Amazon. I was trying to find a shaman to do a cambo ritual six years ago, and they were just sipping on sipping on ayahuasca, so it wasn't a trip. And so when this one came to, up to my my doorstep, I decided to jump in. And generally, with these psychedelics in general, I don't actively try to pursue the experiences. I but I accept when they come my way, and they do come my way every year or two. So I had a really op- good opportunity for this in Mexico uh, with a quite a powerful shaman uh, who lives in Peru, who was up visiting. And I, since I'm Mr. Fearless and Far, decided <laughs> yeah. I know what's behind the door. Like I've, I've done a lot of work reflecting on the scary shit under the bed, right? In the closet. And so I thought, let's see how deep the rabbit hole can go because I think I'm ready. Oh, I then I wasn't really ready. <laughs> Fuck. I had a feeling, but that's why I want to talk about it. <laughs> I foolishly thought that, again, these superficial plastic fears that are just coated on the outside of us that we put there ourselves is what fear is, right? So <sighs> for these ceremonies, there's usually a big yurt or a big tent or something like that. This was like a big white palapa type house with like a grass roof. And there was maybe 15 of us all huddled in a circle around the outside. You all get a bucket because often you throw up, you get pillows, you get blankets. And generally how they work, at least from my experience, is you go in around sunset. Um, the shaman explains a bit of the evening and then you have your experience, which lasts three or four hours. And then you curl up in a little ball in your little, you know, poncho pillow nest and then you sleep until the next morning and then you leave the next day so the ceremony starts and there's a couple candles in the middle he's explaining that uh, tonight he has he's quite excited he's got some guest musicians that are going to be playing music for us for the ceremony Uh, he says he tonight uh, once we all take our first dose of ayahuasca we'll offer a second um, 30 minutes after if you haven't been feeling very much from the first. And then after that, he said the bar will be open so you can come up as much Mm. as you want until they'll close the ceremony around midnight or one. It was about 8 p.m. at that time. And so we all go up. We take one shot of this thick, viscous, 
basically the worst smoothie you could ever imagine. <laughs> Tasted like gasoline tequila and the, the scrapings <laughs> underneath the lawnmower. And it was thick, like pudding thick. Anyway, so you, you, you slurp that down. The kind of thing where you have, you're like, oh yeah, no, I'm totally throwing this up. <laughs> it, was, it was like that. And then so we all take a shot and then they turn off the, the candles, they blow them out. And then again, we wait. And at this point, we haven't eat. You're not supposed to eat anything that day. You're not supposed to eat meat, have sex, uh, drink alcohol, anything like that for a few days before. So we're all pretty empty at this point. And 10 minutes in, you hear a very auspicious burp of just burp, which is someone about to throw up, right? There's only one time anybody ever burps like that. And it's when they're about to throw up. <laughs> and then they pick up the music and it's like bring string instruments and drums and then throw up, throw up. Someone starts crying. And I'm there and I'm feeling totally fine. And I'm like, well, shit, this is going to be a long time. <laughs> and so after about an hour, they flick on a, on a candle again. And there's, it looks like the zombie apocalypse. There's some people like walking around just aimlessly. People are curled up on the ground. Some are laughing, some are crying. And then I, at that point, didn't feel very much. So I go up and another guy goes up. We take one more shot. And I had been... Uh, after that second shot, I had been to that realm before where I, you start to feel emotions, you start to see the paintings and it was good. Uh, but again, I wanted to go deeper. And so I was looking, um, I had my, my watch has like a little glowy thing on there on the hands. And so like, you're not allowed to use technology. So I could kind of see what the glowing hands on my watch were. And after about 30 minutes, I was really starting to trip. So I could really see the, the, the feelings um, and the colors. And I'm like, all right, well, I got to take a leak. So I'm going to go up, take a third shot, go out, take a piss outside and come back in and curl up in my nest. So I go up, take the third shot. I'm not walking very well at this point. Everything's kind of swirling, but I'm feeling good. I go outside um, to go pee in the bushes and I go to pee and then I'm like, oh, you're going to throw up. Mm. And so then I violently throw up three times uh, and then I try to stand up and I realize I can't really sense where my feet are and everything <laughs> around me is giant fractals and patterns. And I'm like, oh shit, okay. And I got to get back inside. And so I'm trying to walk and then I can't find inside. I'm, dude, I'm like 20 feet from the door of the place. I can't find the door there, door anymore. Everything is just a spirograph of uh, of colors. Or what's that the little thing where you kaleidoscope? kaleidoscope. Yeah. I see a pile of leaves. I lay down on the pile of leaves because there's no <laughs> way I'm walking. Mm -hmm. Where it started to get scary though is whenever I've done, drank or done any of things before, um, I was always aware of where I was. I mean, with drinking, maybe you drink too much and you don't really, you, but you forget, you're not aware enough to understand what's happening. But with this, I was laying in this pile of leaves curled up in a ball with a poncho. Um, and I lost sense of where my arms and legs were. I, I didn't, like, I remember squeezing my hands and it felt like my hand was a meter and a half the other direction. Like, mm -hmm. I should be squeezing my left hand right now, but it felt like it was behind my head and definitely wasn't. It was curled up here. And that's when I started to realize, oh shit, because it's like being, a, you're holding onto a life preserver, um, your body and like, okay, I know where I am. I can feel where I am. And then you let go and you're drifting in the ocean where there's no frame of res res reference of where you are or where you're going. That's when things got scary um, because I didn't, I wasn't able to place where my body was. And then you're lost in a dream at that point. And you don't know what, you don't know if you're running or sprinting or you're there. I mean, you can vaguely remember where you are because you remember laying down, but you can't sense anything. I mean, in that state, you're not going to be sprinting because you can barely walk, but still that's a, that's a terrifying place to be. And I remember, so at that moment, I'm laying down, I open my eyes, there's a couple of little candles outside on the walkway, and I start to feel this overwhelming presence of just power of some, like, in the moment, I, it was like the universe or God or whoever you want to call it said, oh, you poor little thing, you thought you wanted to see behind the curtain. Mm -hmm. Well, here's behind the curtain. And it was this swirling mess of just beauty and patterns and colors. It was purple, green, black and white, triangles, squares, radiating with circles and this light, this pulsing light. And I felt that feeling of awe again, where you're witnessing something that you just, you know, is so far beyond yourself. Maybe I could compare it to like seeing aliens for the first time. Mm -hmm. I know people haven't seen aliens generally, but let's say you're, you're, you're watching First Contact where there's green men coming out of a spaceship. That would be 
awe and terror in the sense of, oh my God, this is real. But it, it obviously wasn't aliens. It was, could be God. I don't know. I'm, I'm not particularly a religious guy, but it felt like I was right there witnessing God showing me how the universe worked without being able to sense my body. And all of the terror and awe and fascination and horror of that moment, knowing that I am a worm being shown the schematics to a spaceship. I am incapable of even understanding what paper is, let alone how it all works. And from there, I lost it. I went down into the rabbit hole. I felt that I had died and that this was what was waiting after me melting into this giant web of patterns and color. Uh, I said creationary fear in that post because in that moment, the terror that I felt was horrible. It was, and it felt primal. It felt like I was a, I was prey being chased by predators. I, I don't know what that feels like, but I can see how in the very fundamental part of being a, a living thing on this planet, there is a, a fear that is I mean, I can say fight or flight, but we use that so often. It, it was, it was, it was real, uh, real in a sense that made all of my other fears, all the bullshit, all the things that I just feel so stupid. Come, like, why are why are you afraid of this stupid stuff? Look at what you're beholding. This is the essence of the universe. We are so little and insignificant. I'm a moat floating in the universe. And I'm worrying about what people think about me, why I get a little bit uh, when I, my video doesn't get enough views. Yeah. Bro, chill the fuck out. You know, like there is a whole world beyond what you, this little playground you play in that is so much bigger and powerful than you can ever even imagine. Why do you preoccupy yourself with this bullshit? And it, with that, my my heart was pounding in my chest, pounding. And I... In the beginning of the ceremony, he said, if you need help, yell for help. And I was on the verge of screaming for help mm -hmm. because I did not know where I was. I was, I was attached by a, I was holding on my, my pinky nail to a speeding train. And from there though, I think because I had done so much work with fear, but this was a level of magnitude higher than before. I, I could breathe myself through it. So with my breath, Breath was the only thing I could recognize in the moment. With my breath, I was able to breathe through these, no doubt, panic attacks, but terror attacks, ex existential terror, terror attacks, and be able to get myself back to a point of understanding what this is. I, I probably said to myself, every trip has an end a hundred times. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I was reduced to a quivering man in a in a pile of leaves reciting whimpering to himself every trip has an end every trip has an end you're safe don't worry every trip has an end and that's what got me through probably an hour of time that's what i'm guessing after looking at my watch before and after so uh, another really really incredible thing that happened ben is that during that time i had been making a lot of youtube content and i didn't put the, put this in the post but i'm i definitely am jumping at the the fact to talk about it and the YouTube content in the Yucatan Peninsula around Cancun and Tulum, you might think, ah, oh, it's, it's like, what's there? Everything's here. This is one of the most fascinating parts of the planet. Just everyone gets too caught up with what's happening in the beaches. You can go two hours off the coast here, and, um, like from Tulum, and find villages where people don't speak English. They don't speak Spanish. They only speak Mayan, right? Uh, Just very close to where all of the tourists are getting drunk on the beach. And so we had gone into some of these Mayan, Mayan sacrificial caves in Belize and in the Yucatan Peninsula and saw Mayan sacrificial sites with crystal skulls, skulls that were lopped off the heads of virgins put in these caves and then calcified over over a thousand years. And the idea of human sacrifice seemed so foreign and crazy. Oh my God, they killed people, you know? But they used to get quite twisted on mushrooms and they'd make it a spiritual twip, trip and other substances as well. So... In that moment, when I was there, faced with God, it felt like the, my, the greatest thing I could do with my life was to sacrifice myself to this thing, that I am so insignificant and this is so powerful that it, all, all I can do, the greatest thing I could do is just give myself, offer my body to this 
this feeling, this presence, this being, this universe. And in that moment, I remember realizing, being like, oh, this, this is why human sacrifice exists. Because if you go deep down that rabbit hole, you see who you're sacrificing to and you think it is the best idea. That's all you can do is just give yourself to this thing. You are nothing. It is everything. What does it matter? Take me, please. Mm -hmm. And with that, I understood my sacrifice. Because in that state, it makes sense. Sober? Not really. But it was really powerful to be able to do that. See sacrificial skulls the previous week and then go there and, oh, now I understand how this is possible, right? Powerful experience, bro. Oof. Yeah, I just want to let that breathe for a minute. Wow. <laughs> I was, that was a gripping experience and it makes sense why you're still coming down. Have you, have you had time to like integrate that? Well, we we had a couple, we had a day after and then I was off um, on a two week crazy trip to um, yeah get more videos made and, and stuff. And I, ha- I haven't still fully processed it. And even now there'll be quiet moments where I just wake up and I just stare at the sky or the roof of my hotel room and just try to bring it all in. It was funny. Um, after the experience, there was, uh, again, like around, around midnight or one, you come down enough to be able to walk and talk. And so people are sharing stories. And there was someone there who um, asked me how many times I'd done ayahuasca. And I said, three times. And they said, aw, three times? Uh, And I remember being like, bitch, I just died. (laughs) You know what? Like, if I don't want to, like, I am happy with, if I never do it again, I'm happy. Maybe once a year, maybe once every five years, I will be reflecting on this for my entire life, probably. I don't think number matters. I think it's depth for most things in life. Yep. Because it was, it just fundamentally changed how I saw myself on the planet. Uh, You could probably very easily say that was a bad trip. Uh, Doesn't sound like a fun trip. I I think uh, it was perfect for me. It's what I needed. Mm. It's what I asked for. Um, God, did I not know what I was getting, but um, yeah, it, it, it was, it was perfect for me. Mm-hmm. So why do you say that? Right. Like it reshaped you and I know you're still, you know, integrating it. Um, because why I'm so curious about this and I appreciate you sharing is because I feel like my time's coming up. Like I haven't done it yet and it's slowly, you know, presenting itself more and more and more. And ironically, that is my fear. Like you, it's like, oh, you think you understand fear, do you? <laughs> you know? And yeah. it's like, I know I don't. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, I might understand it more than a lot of people, but that's why I'd want to do it is for my own experience of something not exactly like that, just like to understand it, you know, more than my human self does. So how do you feel like it, was exactly what you needed and helped reshape you. I feel that it has become the cool thing to do and talk about. Um, And I feel like most people don't know how to use it as a tool. I feel that to be able to use it as a tool, you already have to be able to take action in the face of fear. And not everyone is there yet. But if you're able to do that in your normal life, to be able to analyze your fear, to be able to see how action is the, is the solution to fear, and that fearlessness is an action, not a state of being, then you can use these tools, these plant medicines or whatever other psychedelic, to be able to view it yourself in the third party, see what, you, what bullshit that you're telling yourself or is coming up or blocking your way and then be able to bring that back after and then make action in the face of that. Also, again, maybe famous last words. (laughs) I feel like if you have that attitude of everything's an opportunity, not an obstacle, that fear can be a compass, that if you do go deep and have a bad trip, like maybe I did. Again, I don't want to call it a bad trip, but that's because I don't call anything bad, really. You know, if you have that attitude, I think there is an amazing lesson there for you and that you will come out of it 
with a new perspective, as well as a new sense of place of where you are in the universe. And that's how I feel about it. Thanks for sharing that, dude. And it's like, my takeaway, like, I don't view that as a bad trip. I know that's absolute, like you said, a panic terror attack, you know, <laughs> existential terror attack. Because you're human, obviously, like, when our body gets obliterated, right, is like, what you said, like, we lose all sense of safety. It's yeah. just like, because our ego is this thing. And so that's what fear is, right, is to make sure it stays alive. And when that gets blown up, of course, it's like, like utter, just like, not just death, like obliteration. And that's what we're all really terrified of. Obliteration. Exactly. Yeah. And that, that what I realized, maybe this is part of, again, I haven't spoken about this since it happened, man. Like it happened two weeks ago, three, two weeks. And then I was on this crazy whirlwind trip for the past few weeks. So this is the first time I've been able to dissect it, um, which I'm really grateful for, actually. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But I think that what you said is really interesting where the obliteration of yourself, but I guess because I, these planetary fears we have now, these human fears, we always have sense of our body. So we always know where we are. We, we have an anchor in the ocean. You take that anchor away and all you're left with is, is the feeling. And that's where, that's when the rabbit hole gets deep. Yeah, bro. Like even just like in, we can feel it now. <laughs> They're just talking about it. You know, it's like, yeah. Because yeah, when you take that anchor away, it just dissolves. But that's the beauty. Like, obviously, fear does exist, but it doesn't at the sense of like, because when you go to that level, right, of like the energetics of the world or or the universe, it's like, oh, it doesn't even, like, it actually is nothing, you know, because it's like, well, there is no fear if I'm already a part of everything. Like, it's like the worm probably doesn't have like, Oh shoot, like I'm about to die. It's like, oh, like I've done my I'm doing my thing. Yeah, exactly. And then it melts back into the the giant mess of the universe, right? Yeah. Which sounds like to humans, right? Makes us sound insignificant, which our ego does not want. Right. Because we're supposed to have a purpose. We're supposed to like be important and be special and make an impact, which we can and do. And right, I feel like um experiences like that make you appreciate the cycle of life and and death and it's like as a reminder to really like oh like my human fears it doesn't mean that i can't feel them right or respect them or honor them but really i appreciate the fact that they are nothing right that what you wrote of like they are like really nothing and if we can apply that it's and I think that's what part partly scares us though too of <laughs> which this is perfect. I was gonna say what part of what scares us is like that's when we become limitless. Yeah. You know, that's when it's like you don't have an anchor really. Like you can soar and swim and fly in any direction you want. And why I say that's perfect timing is because you mentioned that you might have like a resistance to or fear of success. So I'm curious like how that would tie into that. Well, yeah. When you asked me about which fear I'd like to discuss, I, I, I'm still a little bit muddled on a few things about fear. Mm -hmm. So fear, fear of failure is something that I think we all deal with, especially as creatives. And, I, and there's also fear of success, which I hear people talking about. Um, but I still don't know how to parse out which is which sometimes. Mm -hmm. Because I think they manifest themselves in very similar ways. But I guess I, I wanted to have a discussion with you about it um, cool. to see if we can kind of like dig, dig into two things, fear of failure and fear of success and how they're different, how this, they're the same. And also, I think there's a lot of there for people to just understand about themselves as well. Damn, dude, I love this. Because I was going to do a podcast about this, but this could just be it. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, so what is like when you wrote success, is there something still on your mind that's like, oh, like that is the thing? Like even if it's just a feeling or like an accomplishment, what is the thing that kind of makes you tingle a little bit? Well, I, I, no, but it's not, it's not a fear. I guess I feel like there's, there's um, I call them quiet fears and loud fears. 
Uh, like fear of public speaking or fear of the ocean or fear of asking a girl on the date. Those are loud fears where you feel like a boom, boom, like you, you physically feel the fear. But then there's like procrastination, which you don't feel fear, but it's, it's still a fear in disguise, which is more of a quiet fear, more of a sneaky little bitch that, that'll get you because that's <laughs> like fear of failure or maybe fear of success, fear of, fear of a result, right? Because if you don't put yourself out there and get it done, then you can't, there's no result from it. And so I, with, with the fear of success or fear of, fear of failure, and that my heart doesn't ever pump really, I guess maybe fear of failure when you're, you're, you're doing something in front of a group or there's some result you have to. But I mean, it's still these, these things affect you when you're working in your office at home, right? When you have to get something done. And I know for myself, fear of failure in the beginning was uh, something I dealt with where I, like, I always procrastinated my entire life. Um, that's something that I always dealt with. And I always, like, for example, would, and especially with like, like making videos in the beginning for YouTube, which is how I started, I would always put off, I was scared to, but I was always put off, put off, put off, put off. I was forcing myself to do this thing I was scared of, but I'd also procrastinate because I didn't want to do it because I was afraid of what would happen after. And I guess I compare fear of success a little bit now to maybe how in the beginning of being a creative you ha- you're told to say yes to everything where it's like, yes, 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 yes. And then at a certain point, you have to switch it over and say no to everything because you, it's too much. And I'm wondering where, at least for you, or we can talk about it, where that switch happens. Like you don't, I don't think you have fear of success in the beginning. Do you? Is fear of success kind of like a, a Pokemon that evolves from fear of failure? <laughs> like I, I guess I don't really understand what happens because I don't think you can have, can you have both at the same time? I think one evolves into the other, doesn't it? I love that Pokemon analogy. <laughs> Dude, but so yeah, it can be one or the other of both. And I love how you talk about quiet and loud because it's because we really only pay attention to the loud ones. Right. But what you said about the quiet, right? The sneaky little bitch, right? Is like, those are the ones actually probably doing the most damage to you because you don't know that they're there. Oh, like termites in your house. You don't know they're yes. there, but they're slowly eroding your foundation, controlling oh. everything, right? Yeah, right. And like, People don't even know like procrastination. Of course, like if I'm putting off doing the dishes, sure, that can be like laziness. But like procrastination, what you just said, right? Of like, why am I putting this off of putting this video on YouTube? It's like, oh, I'm terrified of failure. Mm. Right? And it's the same thing with success. So they can evolve. So how I view a lot of the fears, right? Is like in, in my work, I've come to find, of course, there's like an infinite amount of fear, but really like 10 foundational ones. And so you might start at one, but they're all interconnected, Mm -hmm. right? They're all kind of like peeing each other. They're all just like, oh, that's kind of that and that and that. It's like, um, I forgot what movie it is. What's the movie? Oh, shoot. With, I forgot her name. She, it's like, she's going, she's practicing going through the lasers and it's like this, the strings and it has like bells on them and she's blindfolded. I don't know. (laughs) Damn it. I forgot what it is. But anyway, she's training. And it's like, she's literally blindfolded going through these things. And it's like this web of fear. And like, she hits one and then it rings a bell because like they're all connected is what I'm trying to say. Like it rings Mm -hmm. a bell to the whole thing. Um, So simply put, the fear fear of failure, right? Is like, I'm not going to get something. The fear of success is I am going to get something. Mm -hmm. So why would I be afraid of success? For me personally, what I just even overcame is like more responsibility. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I'm resisting becoming more successful because my schedule is going to get more busy, right? And it's like, well, I really enjoy my lifestyle, the freedom that I have. But that freedom could actually just be an avoidance of more responsibility. And why don't I want that responsibility? Well, it feels more pressure. Then I could lose it, right? Then I could fail at having more responsibility. So then it reverts back to fear of failure again, then does it? Yeah, so that's why it's right, like all tied in into each other. And so it's like, but also it's like the fear of success. Like now I'm more visible and now more people can criticize me. Now more people can judge me. Now I have, you know, more to lose. Now it's, and it could even just be a sneaky one where it's like, people don't even realize, like when we talk about money blocks, right? It's like, why don't I want money? Well, because, which is tied to a fear of success because it's like, at some point, like when you were talked to the talked about the very beginning of when you're in fourth grade, at some point, 
and I can speak for myself, I was probably in like fourth or fifth grade when I learned this, is that my mom likened more money and wealth to more physical health problems. Because we had neighbors who were very wealthy and their kids were addicted to drugs. Mm. So her own subconscious like, well, I'm glad I don't have that much money because then this bad thing would happen. Mm -hmm. Like that's her subconsciously, right? Her ego making her feel better and justified. But then it bled into me as a kid like, oh, I don't want money because then bad things will happen. Interesting. So so that could just be like a simple fear of success, Mm -hmm. right? Is because, oh, like more bad things will happen. Does that make Mm -hmm. sense? No, it definitely does. And that's it, right? Like these small little things, just a certain attitude a parent has or a certain word that someone says to you and they they turn, they, they, they manifest themselves in all sorts of adult ways, right? And strange ways you wouldn't be able to just pinpoint without really thinking about it, right? Mm-hmm. I remember for, for my YouTube channel, for the longest time, I didn't want to monetize my videos and mm. because I, I don't like advertising. Yeah. Really, after some consideration, I don't like advertising, but really what it was, I was afraid people would judge me based on the ads. And then for yes. a long time after that too, so I monetized, I didn't do brand deals for the same reason. I'm putting in more ads and I was, again, I don't like advertising. And that's not quite true. I, I remember one one night when I have to think about stuff, I normally get a little cigar and a rum and coke and a notebook. I My life is written in notebooks. I love that, dude. Yeah. And I uh, put on some music and I just try to break, break things down. And I remember journaling one night and I couldn't convince myself. Well, the reason why I wasn't advertising was because I really didn't like advertising or I was half scared people might click away yep. and judge me. And I, I couldn't find a way to prove to myself it wasn't the second one. And so I was like, well, shit, that means we got to do it. And that means we got to find out. And lo and behold, it was the second one. It was. And uh, no one said anything because everyone's advertising. So what the F was I fucking worried about, man? What the F was I fucking worried about? Part of of me is trying to swear less and part of me still wants to swear. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, but that's it. So things like that. And But how do you get to that point? At least for me, it's always been ink on paper. Not, I mean, I use notepads and digital notes, but for me, like I, I have on like I do so many of these books. I just get a get a book and just ha- half of it is to do lists and like Pomodoro method stuff, and the other half is like morning pages and just trying to just dump everything in my brain because only then can you have perspective. At least for me, and I think for most, at least men in general, maybe women too. But I know for men, if you can get your thoughts out on paper, you can just understand your thoughts more and honestly. I think this is something that most people should do because it helps you communicate better too if you know what you think. And and also, at least for me, having the ink on the paper takes more time and at least builds the the, the connection between what you're writing and how you think and feel. And I think it's really important, man, um, to go in that stuff. Otherwise, you can, you can see a therapist. I guess that works too. But a notebook can be a pretty good therapist sometimes too. Yeah, I did. And I appreciate you bringing that up because like, so whether it's, you know, I have a course people can go take or when people work with me on any level, like usually one of the first things we do is something very similar. And I just call it like tracking your triggers. So it's in your phone, right? It's in a journal. Like I give people a little guidebook that they can go use. And it's simply just becoming aware of like, what am I thinking? Because mm. awareness isn't everything, but it is everything because that's where everything starts. Mm -hmm. Like you can't change anything if you're not aware of it. So it's like, just like if someone's just starting, they're listening to this, like, okay, well, where do I begin? Something to the fact of like what you just mentioned, right? Of like, why am I resisting advertising? Boom. That's a trigger, right? Mm -hmm. It's like anything I am resisting, anything I'm jealous, stressful, anxious about, the root of that is some fear, right? Because it's like, if I wasn't afraid, then it would just be, easeful, you know, and like peace and like present in the moment. And so it's just because that's when we can go look under the rock, like what you did as a kid, right? It's like, Mm -hmm. you have to pay attention first of like, where am I getting triggered or anxious or stressed out or whatever? Because then you find out like, oh, it's actually not advertising. It's what people think of me. And I I resonate with that so much, right? The same thing of like me promoting 
of like, well, I don't, I think promoting is like manipulative or I don't want to force people to buy it from me. Mm-hmm. I was like, well, you can literally, it's impossible to force someone online to buy from you. So, right, it's an indication of my own fear, my own limiting belief of what I believe about what advertising and sales is. And so once you begin to track all of those things, you start to figure out the clues and then then you begin to follow them, right? You go to rock to rock right. and follow that fear. And it's like, oh, like these are all connected. And then it means this. And then if people are really interested, I'm not sure. I think you have, um, you have like video or don't you have like free re- resources people can, can go check out on your website or something? Yeah, yeah. You know, I have a, a few videos. You can go to fearlessandfire.com slash fear. And I have a, a, a good video kind of breaking down all of the things that I did in the beginning to help understand how fear is controlling my life. And a lot of it are like integrated in some some cool travel stories because again, I travel and picked up things through traveling that made me understand how fear really works. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, fearlessandfire.com slash fear. Bing. Boom. But but for you, uh, I like what you said there about being able to analyze what's happening in your brain. And I think I saw you that you were meditating today or yesterday or, or something on social media. That That is something that... I had I had the wrong relationship with meditation when I started. I don't do it currently, but I did for a while. But but um, the wrong the wrong relationship was sitting down and getting mad at myself for not being able to clear my mind for twenty minutes <laughs> because I want to do something and put a checkbox next to it. Yeah. And so the idea, at least for transcendental, was what what I was doing is to clear your mind and have a mantra or something where you can keep it going. Um, but what that does. The success isn't clearing your mind. The success is is being able to analyze the thoughts and label them as they come through your head. And how often do we just sit and do that? And so the beauty of of that is because that that lesson lasts forever, at least for me so far. I meditated quite a bit a few years ago, um, but I still, when I think, think and feel things during the day, I can still flag them and notice them because there is always a cheerleader in your head. Um, ha- most of the time, I think for a lot of people, it, it's it's default setting is negative. Uh, I guess it's not a cheerleader then; it's a critic. Yeah. So, a critic or a cheerleader, maybe it switches. But for most of us, it's it's a critic, and we never really, I think, because they're always there, we don't ever really notice what they say. But we're very much influenced by what they say. Yes. And meditation is just the act of sitting down and listening to that critic or cheerleader, if you're lucky, but most often critic. And being like, oh, I really care way too much about this or like what Sally said or what Georgie did. And without that information, you can't you can't journal about it because you don't really know what you're thinking. Like if, if I think, okay, what did I think this morning? I don't know. It's just, there's a rambling of stuff all of the time. But taking 20 minutes or 10 minutes out of your day or even five, whatever you've got, just to be able to sit down and listen to yourself think gives very powerful information of what you need to focus on in your life. Amen, dude. And Bro, this has been it's it's been a really, really cool conversation, obviously from your story to ayahuasca to even to this and tactical and tools that people can take away. And like that's what I'm big on, right? Is like I'm not here just to motivate you. Like I really am wanting like everything I do to provide you the actual tools to go like cha- like physically shift your life. So instead of choosing the path of pain and suffering like you just you mentioned earlier choosing like no this is who i am like this is even though it's scary i know that is the path that leads me to the greatest adventure and meaning and happiness and joy so as we close my dude um do you have any just final words of wisdom practical things people can go check out uh just what is on your heart that you'd like to share I just love the opportunity to hang out with someone like you to talk about this. I mean, I just feel that we can show people the door, but they have to be the ones who walk through. And for yep. most people, they just stare at the door their entire life. Um, what helped me was two things. Number one was, again, realizing that in every every moment of fear, there's a choice to make and there's a fork in the road. And you can choose to be either version of yourself and that person will continue forward with their life. But one will be better and one will be worse, right? 
Uh, also that, again, fear, fearlessness is a choice you make in a moment, not a state of being. Those are two really empowering things. And that even the squirrel suit skydivers, TV hosts and rock stars, they all still feel the fear, just they choose to do it anyway which I'm sure if you've listened to this podcast, you've got that message, but I want to reinforce it. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't hurt, dude. Um, well, dude, thanks so much for being here, for sharing, for getting vulnerable and even talking about your ceremony because that was really cool. I could feel that was still Ross. I appreciate you going there. Yeah. And sure so definitely go check out all the things that Mike is doing, Fearless and Far, YouTube. I mean, it's like... There's some stuff on there and then you're like, whoa, like this dude did this. But yeah. So, so go watch because it's really, really, it's entertaining. It's inspiring. It's funny. It's all of it. Yeah. Actually, the most recent video I posted there was the the quest for the crystal skull. So that, that video where you get to see an actual real life Indiana Jones crystal skull is uh, the most recent video I posted. Dang, dude. Mm-hmm. Well, is there anywhere else you want to go people to go connect connect with you? Yeah, well, YouTube's the best. Again, 1.5 million subscribers, adventure travel place. You won't see very much content like that anywhere else. I'd really try to find special, different things. And of course, on Instagram, the same thing. Fearless and far everywhere. Boom. So, dude, we crushed it. And our message, choose the path of, I was going to say least resistance, but it's actually most resistance, but it creates the path of least resistance <laughs> like, in the future. For sure. If you want to be successful and happy, man, it's, it's going to be the, the, the way that where you go, oh, shit. Uh, all right. guess we're doing this now because we have to. There is no choice. Mm, I love it, bro. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate you, everyone. If you haven't already, please subscribe on YouTube. Please rate and review Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you're listening. We appreciate you so much and we'll see you soon.